Thank you for joining us again as we study through Hosea verse by verse. Our discussion and applications can help you get the most out of this book as you grow in understanding and obedience. Open your Bibles now to Hosea chapter 12. Hosea chapter 12. We're going to look at Ephraim is eating the wind. Let's look at a, a cross reference found in Proverbs eleven twenty nine. Whoever troubles his own household will inherit the wind, and the fool will be servant to the wise of heart. Then in Isaiah 30, verse 18, For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for Him. Who wait for Him. Okay, we're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 6, first of all. The people of Israel feed on the wind. They chase after the east wind all day long. Ephraim feeds on the wind. This is not a phrase you hear every day. I, I'm guessing that mothers do not feed you wind for lunch very often. And I'm guessing that you don't pack some wind in your lunch box to take to work to eat. So what does it mean? The point is actually fairly simple. Wind is not filling. It can't satisfy. No matter how much you eat of it, you'll never be full. It has zero nutrition. In the next phrase, Hosea says, and pursues the east wind continually. The phrase here is very much like the verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 14. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after the wind. King Solomon wrote those words. The phrases are similar and have the same meaning. You can chase after the wind all day. You can even invent clever means of trying to catch it, but you can never grasp it. If you lunge after the wind to grab it and then open your fingers to show what you have in your hand, they'll be empty. All of your efforts will be for nothing. The Jews in the northern kingdom were spending their time and energy chasing after useless things which didn't satisfy. The idea here is also very much like the one in Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, which says that he who sows the wind will reap the whirlwind. Remember that studied. They sowed nothing. Their hands were empty. All of their spiritual endeavors, building altars and idols and offering sacrifices, came to nothing. And all of their pursuits of pleasure yielded them no lasting joy. Contrast this with what Jesus said in John 6, 35. Quote, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. The one coming to me never shall hunger, and one believing in me never thirsts at any time. You see, unlike the wind, Jesus satisfies. He provides meaning and a deep-seated joy that even in the worst of life's trials cannot be taken away. He gives abundant life. In John 10.10, 10, very familiar portion of Scripture, it states the thief, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You see, all these false gods are thieves. They're the spawn of Satan himself. And the father of lies, sole purpose is to destroy. He doesn't want to silence you. He doesn't want to just mislead you. He wants to utterly destroy you. This is what the world has to offer, total destruction of those who pursue it. Jesus' goal is very different. He, Jesus, wants to give abundant life, and he delivers. The end of verse 1 states, oil is carried to Egypt. Ephraim was playing both sides. One, on the hand, they had a covenant with Assyria, and then on the other hand, they still sought Egypt's favor through giving of gifts. Olive oil was prevalent in Israel and one of the most sought after goods from there. The Jews used these material goods to gain favor. But the political games that they were playing would prove worthless as Assyria would conquer them and Egypt couldn't save them. Instead of trusting in their own material goods, they should have been trusting in God to protect them. Here, here's an application. What are some of the ways that we tend to put confidence in our own material wealth instead of God? I want you to contemplate that. Let's look at verse 2, shall we? Now the Lord is bringing charges against Judah. He is about to punish Jacob for all his deceitful ways and pay him back for all he has done. 
Now, most of the book of Hosea is focused on God's message of judgment toward Ephraim. But throughout the book, we're reminded that he has not, he's not happy with Judah either. either. Although generally the people of Judah were more obedient to God than those in the northern kingdom, they still fell short of God's standards. Let's look at verses 3, 4, and 5. Even in the womb, Jacob struggled with his brother. When he became a man, he even fought with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and won. He wept and pleaded for a blessing from him. There at Bethel, he made God face to face, and God spoke to him. Verse 5, the Lord God of heaven's armies, the Lord is his name. As we look at Jacob's history, we can get a, a big clue in verse 6 of what it's all about. In that verse, he says, therefore return to your God. The application of verse 6 is based on the knowledge in verses 3 through 5. The idea is this. Jacob, their ancestor, encountered God. He himself repented of his sin and sought God's favor, and God gave it. This is their history. God gave favor once already when Jacob turned to him. Therefore, based on that knowledge, we, the current generation should also seek God, since their patriarch did. It is a return to God, a return to their roots. It's a, it would be wise to learn from Jacob and seek God's favor as he did. Let's look a little more closely at verse 6. Look at it together. So now come back to your God, act with love and justice, and always depend on him. Return to your God. God is always ready and waiting to welcome his people into his arms, into his family, into his kingdom. Just as in the, uh, in the story of the prodigal son, it's as if God is watching the road, waiting for the day when he will walk down it in humility to return to him. He earnestly desires that, but at the same time, that story reminds us that he waits for the prodigal to return of his own volition. The prodigal must make the choice. No one makes it for him. Verse 6 also says, act in love, kindness, and justice. A return to God will be marked by a change in behavior. Genuine repentance brings about genuine fruit. Basic kindness to others and a loyalty to justice in one's dealings are signs of a regenerated heart. Now, here's an application. Who is someone you can show kindness to this week? What is a practical way that you can do this? Let's look at verse 6 again. It says, always depend on him. Another translation says, wait for your God continually. Waiting for God is a theme seen throughout the Bible. It may help to understand this phrase by first taking a look at its opposite. The opposite of waiting for God is to rashly or hastily jump into something based on your own intelligence. The Battle of Jericho is an example of waiting for God. If they, if they formed their own plan to assault the walls, they would have failed. God's way was unexpected and unconventional, but ultimately it was successful. Think of Nehemiah. Nehemiah heard about the desperate state of Jerusalem, and he immediately began praying, but he didn't approach the king yet. Only after four months of waiting for God's timing did the perfect timing come. The king actually asked him about what was going on, giving him a wide open door to move forward. And then he only moved forward after once more a quick prayer to God for wisdom in Nehemiah chapters 1 and 2. Waiting for God can be difficult. Throughout life, we wait for God in many areas. Some people are waiting for marriage. Others are waiting the right job opportunity. Others are waiting for an open door in a specific ministry. Note there's a difference between doing nothing while you're waiting and waiting with a goal. There, there, there's a difference with having no plan and no real desire to move forward than patiently and humbly seeking the will of God. Let's look at verses 7 through 11. In John 3, 19 through 20, it says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. In verse 7, it speaks of a merchant selling from a dishonest scale. 
They, they love to cheat. One way that sellers try to increase their profit margin is by lying about the weight of the product they're selling. To do this, they use faulty scales which show the incorrect weight, always more, of course, of the item that's purchased. Proverbs 11.1 1 says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. People are sinners, and the sins we commit are only as limited as our own creativity. Even though we are technologically advanced in the world that we live, it merely means that there are more opportunities for stealing in inventive ways. The passage says that their payday is coming. It may be a while off, but it will arrive without fail. Verse 8 says, Ephraim was prideful and deceived. I found wealth for myself. The people didn't acknowledge God's blessings. Israel gave themselves all the credit for the riches. The so-called self-made man believes that his success is due to his own strength and intelligence. But all the resources we have, the environment we grew up in, and even our health and IQ are all gifts from God. The Bible says in James 1.17, every good gift is from above. We should be careful to be humble about our successes. Instead of giving credit to ourselves, we should give glory to God where it's due. Israel claimed to be sinless in the methods they used to gain money. They said, no one has caught me cheating. My record is spotless. They were deceiving themselves. Clearly, God does not agree. Verse 7, he points out, their false balances. And in verse 9, he reminds them that he has been caring for them for a long time. After all, he found them as slaves and set them free. And it's also almost as if he's saying, I am your father. I know what you've done. He's, he's been with them the whole time. They can't hide their sin and deceit from him. It says, God knows all and sees all. The main point in verse seven, verses 7 through 11 is that they kind of hide their sin from God. In verse 8, we see their attitude as they claim that they cannot find in me iniquity or sin. Verse 9, he is the Lord. He has complete power over them, either to rescue or to return them to their humble state. And then verse 10, he sent prophets and gave visions. He was trying to speak to them. Let's look at verses 12 through 14. He talks about humble beginnings. The Israelites were prideful about their wealth and status. So God reminds them of their humble beginnings. Their patriarch, Jacob, was a sojourner. He had to flee from his own home to escape his own brother. He had nothing, no money, no home, no friends. He had to work as a hired hand just to be able to get married. And from this man, God raised up a great nation. He sent them to the prophet Moses to deliver them from Egypt. He guarded their way. He delivered them from their enemies. He brought them into the land. It's all about him. It's always all about him. It was by God's power that they were made a nation. It's by God's power that they had a country. It's by God's power that they had a home to call their own. But instead of thanking God, they took credit for themselves and forsook him. It continues, Ephraim has given bitter provocation. Their pride and rebellion was an act of provocation against God. Scripture says God will repay. Israel was going to have to face the consequences for their behavior. God saw it. They tried to deny it and cover it up, but he saw their sin. He saw their rebellion. He saw them as they truly were, and they wouldn't escape his justice. We continue reading, we should recognize our own humble beginnings. You see, it's much easier to begin the race than to finish it. Many professing believers give up. Many others become prideful or self-reliant as the Jews are described in this chapter. We would do well to remember Paul's admonition in Galatians 3.3. Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? We are saved by God's grace. We walk in God's grace. If we are to finish the race, it will also be got by God's grace. Shall we pray? Father, thank you. Thank you for Hosea chapter 12. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of our beginnings, of our sinfulness. 
And then, Lord, of you coming into our life because we opened up our arms, said, Lord, come in. You were there all the time, but you were waiting for the invitation. So, Lord, we invite you into our lives and say, Lord, take over, take control. Lord, that we might walk in your will and your purpose and your plan. That, Lord, we would be humble before you, understanding that all we are, all we have, all we ever shall be is because of you. Thank you, Jesus, for your word tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you once again for joining us tonight. Thank you for listening to that message. If you responded or if you have any questions, you can go to www.tlfchurch.com slash connect. Leave your contact information and your message. Hit submit and we'll have one of our church staff reach out to you. Remember, you can give online through our website or you can send in your tithes and offerings by mail. You can find all the info on how to do that by going to www.tlfchurch.com slash online dash giving. Thank you so much for your continual support during this time. We want to let you know that we have our Kids Church Online that meets on a weekly basis through our secured Google Classroom. If you're interested in our Kids Church Online platform, please visit our TLF Online page. Click on the Kids Church Sign Up button to connect with one of our leaders. On Sunday nights, our prayer team is committing one hour of prayer from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. If you have any prayer requests or praise report, you can leave us a message on our TLF online page, or you can send us an email at prayer at tlfchurch.com or send us a text at 323-389-7006. On Wednesday nights, we have our midweek unplugged Bible study at 7 p.m. in which a new devotional will be posted on our website. We thank you for joining us online today. We hope that you are blessed, encouraged, and challenged through that message. Hit like, subscribe, feel free to share this video with others. We love you. We thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again next time. God bless.